Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And today, we are going to be talking about how to mix your own stuff. An alternate title of this episode would be, Don't Mix Your Own Stuff, and here's why. But if you're going to do it, I've also got some, like, here's what you should do to avoid some of the pitfalls and the reasons why I say, Don't! And I get it, some of you are absolutely in a position where you feel like you've got to mix your own stuff. I hope to persuade some of you that you actually don't got to mix your own stuff. But there's financial reasons I can't. There actually might not be. And we'll get into that. But for those of you who are determined to do it, I want you to know the possible pitfalls. And I want to give you some workarounds to deal with so that you can have a better time of mixing your own stuff if you're persuaded that's what you should be doing. So we're going to get into all of that, the pitfalls, the pros, the cons, and the best practices to make it better. What do I have to do before we get into it? Just one thing, the briefest of shout outs to our sponsors in the sponsor section, who include most important sponsor being you. How do you sponsor this podcast? You sponsor this podcast with your likes and hopefully your love, but your likes are actually enough for the YouTube algorithm. They do not require love. So if you tap the like button, that really helps, uh, spread the word about this podcast. Super duper helpful. Also, consider giving us a rating and review if we were on one of the audio-only versions like uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It really does help spread the word. Also, big shout out and thanks to Sound Toys, who are actually currently giving away a whole bunch of licenses. I believe it's five licenses to their software bundle over at sonicscoop.com slash contest. That's sonicscoop.com slash contest. They make some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. And you can try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. But you can also potentially win for free a whole bunch of their plugins worth hundreds upon hundreds of dollars over at sonicscoop.com slash contest. So definitely check that out. Also, big shout out and thanks to Arturia for sponsoring this week. They are making some of the best sounding analog soft synths out there. They were one of the first companies to make good sounding analog recreations, but that's not all they do these days. I mean, they actually make hardware these days, which is incredible and interesting. And they make a whole bunch of plugins that not enough people know about because they do great plugins as well, like general audio effect plugins. But they also have really interesting cutting edge synthesizers of their own design, like Pigments 3, which is just out recently, which is an additive synth that makes a whole bunch of absolutely stunning, crazy, interesting sounds. One of the most flexible since out there. Also, last one, and then we're just right back into the content. The last one is Focusrite. I'm talking to a lovely Focusrite Claret 2 Pre right now. Hasn't given me a lick of trouble. Amazing bang for the buck stuff. And if you are a Focusrite user, you are a member of the Focusrite Plugin Collective where they're giving away free plugins constantly to all of their users. So definitely check that out. I believe that when I'm recording this, they're giving away, is it the Acoustica Cream? They make wonderful plugins. So definitely uh, check that out. Focusrite.com. All right, let's get into the meat of the story. Why do I say, don't mix your own stuff before I say, okay, if you're going to, here's some best practices on doing it better. Well, I actually just had this experience. Here's the biggest reason. I just had this experience with a mastering client of mine who was mixing his own stuff. Did a great record, you know, a whole, really a lot of effort went to this thing. Great performances, really good arrangements, good tones. And I think, I, I think, and Klein apparently thought too, the mastering really took it to another level. It was really kind of getting up there with, you know, some of his favorite records. But one of the things he said was telling, you know, we had gone back and forth in a couple revisions on this one, you know, a little bit more than normal for me because he was really, you know, particular about it. And he was, you know, really invested in every step of the process. And he said, you know, I just want to get this thing done so I can put it out there and then never hear these songs again. And we all laugh at that and it's like, yeah, I totally get that. We've all been there, right? But that's probably not how you should feel about your songs if you want to have a career as a musician. Now, for a lot of people who don't want to have a career as like a touring musician where you're going to go out like, because tours are still important or live performance, even in the, you know, quarantined age we just came out of and all that stuff. Even then, live performance is important, like even in a virtual way and going forward, even when as things get back to more normal, performing in a virtual way is going to be important as well as performing live in front of people because live performance, I mean, for the past few decades now has been a much bigger money earner for artists than recorded music. 
It's ironic because way back in like the 1970s or so, like often for a lot of artists, the concerts were a loss leader where they'd take a loss on the concerts, but they sold records because of those concerts and the con the records made the money, even though the concerts didn't really. And now it's almost the other way around, you know, for the past few decades here, it's like artists often lose money on the recording, but then make it back by live performance and the recorded music serves as a calling card for come see our show where they they actually end up making more money why it is that way and whether it should be that way and all that stuff we can talk about in some other episode but that's the reality and if you want to have like a career as a musician you probably shouldn't hate your songs be tired out on them and never want to hear them again because you're not going to be able to tour them you're not going to be able to promote them now if you are more content to be a hobbyist musician or you just see these songs as like a stepping stone and like this is a calling card and it's going to lead you to other things and other songs you write in the future then it could be fine but i really think that the biggest reason to mix your own stuff like the best reason to mix your own stuff is because you want to transition from being a musician to being a mixer audio engineer producer person and you really like the idea of working on other people's music in like the pro audio realm and you want to do more of that you feel like you've gone as far as you want with just the performing music side and you want to shift gears a little bit and you want to get your chops up so that you can transition into being an audio engineer, music producer, mixer, person. And that's a totally legit and good reason to mix your own stuff because you have some control over it and now you have this thing that says, hey, I did this, I could do something good for you too. But I want to give you that warning that a lot of people who start recording and mixing their own stuff stop being musicians and start being audio engineers or maybe music producers. And if that's not what you want for yourself, be aware of that. If what you really want is to be a musician, an artist, whether professionally or as a hobby, then I'd encourage you not to record and mix your own stuff. Because you don't want to feel like about your baby, like, oh, this baby's wonderful but I'm kind of tired of looking at it now. Get out of here. I don't want to have to deal with raising you for the rest of your life. Like that's a, And that's how your song should be, right? Your song should be like, my goodness, these are the messages that I have to get out. They haven't been heard enough yet. I haven't sung these songs enough. People haven't heard this enough. I've got to get out there and play these things in front of people. There's so much fun to do. And that's very hard when you've heard your song 99 times on repeat in one day while you're mixing it and then you're not good at mixing yet so you go back and do the same thing the next day and then you spend like so much time mixing this thing that you've heard it like 99 times in a day for like 99 days in a row and then it's like you never want to hear it again so that is a big pitfall number one is that it's going to be really hard to be a professional musician who goes out and supports your music and performs your music in front of others even a hobbyist musician who performs music in front of others if you're that involved in the recording and mixing process. So big potential benefit to not doing it that way. There are certain genres where that's not as big of a problem as others, maybe, but I think it's a problem potentially even in electronic music. Although the people who do it well in electronic music or in other genres where they mix their own stuff and are still able to go out and perform the stuff because performing is big even in electronic music like that's how it actually works they have figured out the other stuff i'm going to tell you the best practices for making this not a problem or not as nearly as much of a problem all right so that's problem number one problem number two here is that it's going to be hard for you to keep perspective in particular singers people who sing like on records have a hard time with getting the level of their vocals right. And I run into often with people mixing their own stuff, one of two problems. One, their vocal, this is the most common one, their vocals are mixed too low because they already know every word. They already know the things that they're saying and that they're singing. And maybe to some degree, they're not confident in also pushing their vocals too much or their vocals get buried and we don't get the tone or impression that we get from their favorite records where their vocals are actually pushed louder than on their mix. So that's one problem. Sometimes some people, and this is a smaller number, but it happens, 
have the opposite problem. And I find this a little bit more with really confident people in hip hop and R&B, which is that they push their vocal too loud because these are just a little bit more often that people in singers in hip hop and R&B have a little bit more confidence about putting their voice out there and like they know their voice is the most important thing and their voice and what they have to say is what they want to get out there and they want to make sure that not a single word is missed because they really slaved over like the the play on words that they're doing or they really you know refined their vocal chops or whatever it is and they sometimes push their vocals a little bit too loud where it doesn't seem right compared to some of their favorite records so that's also a potential problem. I find that the first problem happens a little bit more in rock and pop. The second problem happens a little bit more in hip hop and R&B, but there's some crossover there. So be aware of that stuff. Vocal levels in particular, but if you play a different instrument in your group or whatever it is, even if it's you solo, like in like bass is your main instrument and that's your first love or whatever, then maybe the bass gets mixed too loud, even though it's not the right thing for the song. That kind of stuff can absolutely happen. So how do you keep perspective on those things? And I think references is one of the ways to keep perspective on those things. And collaborators is another good way to keep perspective on these things. So the other big thing I'm going to recommend to people who are mixing their own stuff is please, if you're not using a mixing engineer to help you, and that's fine if that's what you want to do, at least use a mastering engineer to help you. At, at least on one song, if you if you really say finance, money is the problem, I can't do it. Like take one song where you finish it yourself and then send it to a mastering engineer. Hear how good it can come back to you with that professional mastering engineer doing it. And potentially if they're one of those mastering engineers like me who's very communicative, you can request feedback and they can give you really specific feedback, which is what I do for a lot of my clients where it's, you know, a lot of them are making some of their first serious releases. You know, I work with some artists who have, you know, or who are known and have decent followings and make a living at and done five or six or seven records and they come to me. But let's face it, the majority of people making music are making their first records, not their 10th records, right? There's just a smaller number of people in the world making their 10th records than making their first. So it actually works that way in the the numbers a little bit with the people who come to me. So a lot of people are asking for that initial feedback and I'm happy to give it. And one of the things that I love to see is the next mix comes back and so many of the problems we discussed were like solved. And like each mix they give me is better than the last one because they got that other set of ears on and they got the feedback. And even if you don't have the professional mastering engineer doing the whole thing, at least doing it on one track so you can get that feedback, so you can get that third party advice, hear where the problems are, hear how far off you are in the low end or if any elements are poking out and getting that feedback and then integrating into your mixes, even that step can be wonderful. Of course, I would recommend the whole thing of, you know, having someone master the entire record, even if you're going to mix it for yourself. And I'll also share with you an experience of another artist. Um, This guy called Brother Tiger is his artist name, John Jagos. And I just remember sitting with him one day. Man, this was years ago that I think I worked on one of his records, Out of Touch. I did fairly well, got him some good notoriety and press. And I think some of the videos from that have, you know, I I think some of hundreds of thousands of views on the, the YouTubes and lots of plays on the Spotify's and all that stuff. And, you know, he had uh, some success with his record. And it was his second, I think, significant one as an artist. Sorry if I'm wrong. But he had done the first one like all by himself, completely, without someone mixing and without, you know, a separate person mastering it. And he got good results and he actually got some good press and feedback off of his first release he did by himself. And that got him a little bit of budget to do the next release where he could help have someone help mix and have someone help master. And he did that. And he said, having done it both ways, even though I think I got pretty good results in the end on recording and mixing everything myself, the process was so much better, so much more enjoyable and so much more fun when I wasn't doing that. Artist called Yolklor, and another one that has, I think some of his videos is, have you know millions of views on YouTube and again had some good success. And he got me to master it. And one of the things he really liked about the process similarly was that ability to sit down and listen to the big picture and make big aesthetic decisions and let us worry about this little niddly stuff and listening to the track, you know, way too many times. So A, he could have the big picture perspective and B, so he could be a musician. 
because this is a person who, like so many songwriters and musicians state, knows some studio stuff. But again, saw that value. And I I think it's something where those two connected. They had a similar experience of feeling the difference between doing it all yourself and having others do it and how much better it feels to get other people to help. How much more that allows you to focus on the music, the actual important part that's going to get people to want to listen to this stuff. Because as much as I like what I do in mastering and I think I help enhance recordings and make them more palatable and more impressive and easier to want to hear again and again, it really comes down to what the artist is doing. And a record that isn't mastered as well or mixed as well, that's just really compelling musically, is always going to do better. But one of the ironies is that if you get other people to help with the mixing and the mastering, then so much of your focus can be on the getting the music better, that the music is better. So that's another really big thing. Not to mention that then you have the energy and the bandwidth to go out there and instead of saying, oh, I'm glad this process is over. That just took it out of me. I spent the last year and a half making this album and I'm ready to be done and never listen to these songs again. And now I get to forget these songs ever existed and not bother promoting them or playing them in front of people because it just happened so much. You listening to this may have felt this before in your life. You may have seen your friends go through it. They breathe a sigh of relief and they say, oh, and now we're supposed to like get people to hear it somehow? Well, I'm just done. And I don't want that happening to you. And that's why I think you should work with other people. All right, here's the other part that I promised though. If you're going (laughs) to just ignore all of my advice and you're going to mix your stuff anyway, which some of you should do. Absolutely. Like you want to get better at mixing. You want to know the process. Like I said, John Jagos, he mixed his own stuff and it gave him the credibility and the ability to then mix stuff for other people. Super big, super helpful. It gave him a calling card so he could do both. He could be the musician, the solo artist, and be the producer, the mixer. And there's so many people who've done that and even higher level. I'm just bringing up one thing that came to mind because I remember sitting on the couch and having that conversation with him about it. But there's so many people who've had that kind of experience and done really well with it. So if that's something that you want to add to your repertoire, then you should do it at least once, right? So if you are going to do it, but you potentially want to actually be an artist and all that stuff, here are the best practices. One, you need to make it as efficient as possible and as fast as possible and as time effective as possible because you want to keep the listening to your song 99 times in a row for 99 days in a row. You want to keep that to a minimum. So you need a system for mixing. But before we even get to the system for mixing, you need to be mixing as you go. You need to be recording every single sound in a way where you're like, that basically sounds mixed already. It already sounds like a record. A record. I'm not going to have to go back and fix the, it in the mix later. It already sounds good. My goodness, why do I even need to mix this thing? If you're doing that, great. It's going to turn out killer and you're going to spend less time going over the song again, 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 again. You're going to spend less time going over the mix again, again, all that stuff. So thing number one, make sure that every sound that's going in sounds like a finished record. Don't wait till later to get the sound right. Get it right now. And this is something that people in the electronic music genre get. And that more people in you know rock and pop could get. You got to make it sound like your record every step of the way. And the mixing should be a little bit more of a formality in the end. So step number one is... Make it sound the way you want to while you're recording it. Step number two is have a system for mixing. Things like what I teach in Mixing Breakthroughs, the full-length course. But this isn't just to pitch my course. You could learn this stuff from any number of people who aren't me. Although if you've been listening to me rant for this long, probably may as well learn it from me because apparently you don't mind to hear me rant for this long. So, I mean, are you going to do better? Anyway... The whole idea of having a system of mixing, the biggest thing is to get all the technical considerations out of the way first before you start mixing. 
And you don't necessarily have to reinvent your rough mix. Ideally, your rough mix is pretty close to the finished thing. And now we're putting on final polish, final sweetening, focusing a little bit more on making sure we're uncovering masking, that making sure volume relationships are in the right place, that it's a little bit better dynamically controlled than it was. Maybe we're doing some volume automation and maybe even some effect automations and rides and things like that. And having a step-by-step -step process that allows you to mix your song in like four hours. Like you sit down and you're like, I have four hours to mix this song. And when I'm done with that chunk, I'm done for a really ambitious production, maybe it's longer, maybe it's eight hours, maybe it's, you know, a day and then you come back for another half day, you know, if you're still learning this stuff. But if you've done it a bunch, you can get it down even on really dense mixes to like four or five hours if the recordings were done well. So the mix should be tight. It should happen quickly because you have an order of operations, a process that allows you to work efficiently and really focus on the things that matter. So you need to have a system for mixing. There may or may not be an initial step zero before these two steps. So there may be three steps. Step zero could be that you demo this stuff before you even start recording it. I should probably do a whole episode about demos. But pre-production can potentially matter for you a lot. Pre-production meaning if you like to right into the multi-track and you're not prepared to get like all the sounds right while you're doing the creation and you like to write into your DAW, then you might have a process where you first write with the DAW and then after you've like worked out the arrangement and the production, you're done with the demo and now you're going to record it for real. That process is not relevant for everyone. I would say again, in electronic music production, you're less likely to go through that process. But if you're more a musician who's playing instruments by him or herself, then that process of first demoing things, getting the performance and the arrangement right, and then going and recording can be extremely useful. And that's even more useful if you're a band. Like the demo creates the vision, and then the real recording improves on that vision. So I hope that is useful for you. I would say that those are the biggest things. The potential step zero of demoing, particularly if you play live instruments or especially if you're in a band, definitely the step one of recording everything so that it already sounds finished before you mix, so you don't have to do as much rehashing. And then the final step of having a system to mix so you can mix quickly and efficiently and not go over the mix again and again and again and again and blow your brains out on just the mix. Also, referencing is absolutely huge. I think that that's useful for getting volume relationships right, especially if you are mixing instruments you played yourself, that you want to double check references because you can have a skewed perception on things that you've played yourself. And then the last thing being, if you're not having someone else mix it, at least work with a mastering engineer. And if not for the whole album, at least for one track, it really is helpful to get someone who's like in your corner, on your side, who wants to see you do well and can give you feedback if needed or as needed. And if the feedback is just like, it sounds great, you're done. I mean, that's wonderful. But chances are, if you're listening this far in this episode, the feedback may be more significant than that. It might be Things are sounding good, but you might not realize you have a whole much, bunch more 80 hertz in your recording than in like everything else that's ever been recorded because there's a weird thing happening in your room. Or eh, you're pushing the vocal a lot harder than a lot of your favorite records. And unless you really want that, then let's, you know, back off on it a little bit. Or maybe you're not hearing it, but the cymbals are a little shrill around 10K. Maybe you're not hearing that in your system, that kind of thing. Or just feedback more generally on how balances are working if you desire that kind of feedback. And ask for that kind of feedback if you want it because there are a lot of mastering engineers who won't give it because they don't want to step on toes unless they're asked, you know, because the worst thing in the world is giving or getting unsolicited advice, right? So solicit it if you're looking for advice, it'll help you get it. Well, I hope that's been useful for you. Have any of you ever mixed your own stuff before and ran into problems? Have you, any of you done both or like you did mix your own stuff and then you didn't? And what was the process like? Let us know in the comments down below. I'd really love to hear your stories, your anecdotes on this stuff. Share with the community commenters down there because it's actually a surprisingly good one on this channel. 
And also you can email me at podcast at sonicscoop.com if you prefer to uh, just shoot me a note individually. I do read all of those and I respond if or when I can. Well, I can't always respond to every one of them. I do promise I can at least read them. You can also ask questions down there in the comments or by emailing podcast at sonicscoop.com. Thanks again to you for checking out this episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. Big thanks also to Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative effects in the known universe, to Focusrite, who have supplied this lovely Claret interface I'm speaking into, and to Arturia for sponsoring this episode. I also want to give you some stuff for free. Remember, Sound Toys giving away five licenses to their Sound Toys 5 bundle, which is... I think like a $500 value or something along those lines. We're giving that stuff away for free. We give away more than $100,000 of gear for free each year at sonicscoop.com slash contest. So definitely check it out there at sonicscoop.com slash contest. You can also get some free stuff from me like the five habits of every great mixer free workshop. You can get sonicscoop.com slash mix habits at sonicscoop.com slash mix habits or Mastering 101. If you want a free primer on mastering, check that out at sonicscoop.com slash mastering101. That's sonicscoop.com slash mastering101. Also, if you want to go even deeper, I got the full-length courses. If you got this far, you're probably going to like them. Mixing breakthroughs. If you're going to be mixing your own stuff, definitely check it out. Gives you a system for mixing. Mixingbreakthroughs.com. It's going to change the way you approach everything, and it has improved the mixes of hundreds of people for the better. I mean, the feedback I've gotten on this about how it's changed the whole process for people. And and I've heard for myself how it's improved their mixes. Just phenomenal. So check out mixingbreakthroughs.com. Or if you want to know everything that I know about mastering, check out Mastering Demystified at masteringdemystified.com. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for hanging out with me. See you next time.